Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, another session of Idaho Open Education Week. And this session is about the Idaho Think Open Fellowship, a long running fellowship out of the University of Idaho. And leading a panel conversation is my colleague, Marco. And with that, take it away, Marco. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan, and thank you for the panelists and for everybody who's attending the conference today. Um, this is the first time, obviously, that we're doing this conference. So um, as part of the planning committee, it's really exciting to see everything come to fruition. So as Jonathan said, my name is Marco Saifoli Valencia. I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Idaho Library. I'm also the manager of the Gary Strong Curriculum Center, which is a small library located in the College of Education. So uh, with me today, I have three panelists who are all faculty at the University of Idaho. Um, I want to actually let them do introductions on themselves or for themselves to kind of contextualize what they're doing a little bit more. Um, but each one of them is a current Think Open fellow. So they're someone who is in our current fellowship program. And just to tell you a little bit about that before um, I introduce them, I want to actually share my screen. So let's attempt that. And the Think Open Fellowship program, I'm just going to show you our website to give you a little context for it. Um, it's a uh, like faculty incubator program. So basically what we do is we have a uh, little stipend that rewards faculty for actually transitioning one course to an open or low cost text. Uh, we do distinguish here between open and low cost. So an open you know, might be something using only those materials that have those like five R's that Jonathan mentioned. Um, but we also think that the goal here is really to get uh, high quality materials in front of our students at a low cost. So low cost uh, programs have also been welcome. And basically I think we've had, I think this is our fourth cohort. So uh, this is our little page where you can learn about what we've done. And really we've covered a, a lot of different areas and a lot of different content with our Think Open fellowships. So uh, one of our really well-known projects that came out of it is this inquiry-based music theory book, which cre was created by Professor Sean Butterfield. And one of the things that's interesting about this book is it's an open music textbook, it's a music theory book. And so this is a book that was actually written collaboratively with a class, um, but it also allows for live editing via some special programming we did at the library, right? So this is something where we were able to leverage some of the technology skills that we have with the librarians um, currently, and then also what uh, Professor Butterfield's desire was for his uh, you know, kind of teaching goals and pedagogy. We've also had outcomes that have um, you know, impacted higher level courses in Spanish for instance, this was really interesting because this course actually involved us finding Spanish language OER, which introduced some um, interesting complications. And we've even had OER that have been used locally in um, elementary schools here. So developed for use both in the College of Education and then also to be used um, at Palouse Prairie Charter School, which is a local uh, K through nine, I believe, maybe K through eight school in the Moscow area. So uh, for our faculty fellows today, um, we have Bob Bur Burelli. I believe, although Bob, please correct me when uh, you introduce yourself, Sarah Bush, and then Janine Dara, who will be all introducing themselves and talking a little bit about their Think Open project. So to kind of start us off, I'd love if we could just kind of do a round robin and talk through um, each person, just uh, introduce yourself and your discipline and maybe a little bit about your OER Think Open project. Um, so Bob, why don't you go first, uh, just because you're right next to me on the screen. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to the panel. My name is Bob Borelli. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Idaho, but I'm on the Idaho Fall Campus, and I'm in the newly created Department of Nuclear Engineering and Industrial Management. Um, I teach a fundamental nuclear engineering course that is fairly common across the country with the departments, and I've been compiling online resources um, due to the expense of textbooks since about 2015 when I attended a workshop um, in Boise hosted by the State of Idaho Department of Education. Uh, so right now, <clears throat> for my fellowship, it's basically um, streamlining and polishing my online educational resources um, using the uh, Lumen Learning platform. Thanks, Marco. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, Sarah, why don't you go next? Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Bush, and I am an assistant professor of agricultural leadership and communications. Um, I, I got involved with the Think Project uh, kind of involved because I've already was doing it in a few different classes. And I had one class that's a dual enrollment that is kind of our introduction to agricultural communications and leadership, where I just couldn't even find resources that were really usable for teaching dual enrollment and at a 200 level. Um, most of the research that was out there, even those research articles were just too high level for those individuals and they weren't quite prepared for them. So um, I've created uh, bi-weekly uh, readings for that course for the second half of the course where there wasn't already associated text. 
Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And what platform did you use for your OER that you created? Uh, they're just currently PDFs. That's right. That's what I thought. So that one is, I actually really like that project because it's like platform agnostic, right? It's, we, we used uh, Word and Google Docs, I think, to get it done. And now we have the PDFs. Awesome. Okay, Janine, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and your project? Hi, my name's Janine Dare. I'm an associate professor of literacy and English as a second language. Um, I have kind of two projects going on at the same time. So the first one is connected to teaching and that is trying to get rid of my textbook, my expensive textbook for um, my introduction to teaching English as a second language course. And my other project is connected to my research and outreach. And that is um, transforming teaching materials that I have created for teachers in rural Nicaraguan schools onto um, an OER platform. Awesome. Um, Janine, why don't we uh, ask you the second follow-up question just since you're talking. And I'm curious, what inspired you to get started with OER? So well, what <laughs> brought you in here? <laughs> So oh, um, I've been wanting to get rid of my textbook because it is expensive. The course is asynchronous and that's largely because I do have students across the world taking the class so I can't be um, locked into a time. So I've been wanting to get rid of the course and then when this opportunity came up it was sort of the um, motivation to get going on that. Um, yeah. Had you heard about OER? Do you remember where you first heard about it or I, how it came onto your awareness? I actually heard about it in conjunction with the second project, the research project where I was trying to figure out a way to, um, to make the app that we had created more accessible to people around the world. So I'd had a meeting with Marco about that. And then he introduced me to the whole concept of OERs and it seemed like that would be a great fit. For that Did project. you think of, so you had made this app, which for folks who don't know, um, basically, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because obviously I'm summarizing your project here, but the way I understand it is this app was being uh, used actually in places around the world and includes trauma-informed educational content. So actually training teachers how to teach while giving them teaching lessons that also inf include the sort of trauma-informed teaching that you might need in some of these very challenging situations where this is being used in places like Nicaragua. I think maybe you mentioned Syria. And so you actually had a, an app that you had put together. Did you think of the app as being open? I mean, I think the app was free for people to use, but there was also some constraints, right? Right. So the project actually started um, with hard copy, actually laminated materials that I co-created with teachers in rural Nicaraguan schools to withstand rainy weather. Um, and I was set to deliver that curriculum with students um, from University of Idaho and a revolution broke out in the country about three days before we were set to leave. So I needed a platform that wasn't physical materials, which is what I was going to do here. Have, right. have this. Right. So um, we partnered with some senior students in the computer science program who put together this app. So they transferred the materials to the app, which was great, except I am not a computer science um, person. And so whenever there's a problem with the app, I can't fix it. Mm. Um, so I can't fix it quickly. I have to reach out for help. Um, and also then I started working with teachers of refugees in various locations and I, I want them to be able to add content as well. And, and the app is really restricted that way. And I think we're not very far into exploring um, what the OERs can do, but I think that's going to allow those teachers around the world to co-create um, content for themselves as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Bob and Sarah, I wonder if you have any thoughts on anything Janine said, or if we want to move on to our next question, which is what have you learned or been surprised by working with OER? So I, either angle, if there's anything that resonates with you, you know, Bob, I'm wondering if there's anything about the Lumen platform that, um, you know, has 
you know, surprised you or particularly engaged you with the OER or anything about the practice in general? Uh, just any thoughts y'all might want to share. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think Janine's doing a lot more important work than me because I'm just dealing with neutrons. So I commend, I commend the work with Nicaragua. It's very difficult probably to get actual research done when there's, an, when there's a real revolution taking place. So <laughs> good luck there. Um, in terms of uh, the Lumen platform, most of my courses are lots and lots and lots of applied math. Lumen platform allows for LaTeX math mode, so I can do lots of equations, um, and it's it's quite easy. So that's that's a, a good feature of the Lumen platform. I haven't tested any other platforms because when I went to the workshop in Boise in 2015, they gave us the space on the Lumen platform. So I said, okay, I'll just take that then. So I, I can't really compare it to anything, but I, I'd rather use a text editor to word process and stuff like that, but it's fine. It's, it's not a problem. And if you know HTML tags and codes and stuff, you can work through it pretty quickly. One of the things that I like about our Think Open Fellowships is we've kind of covered a range of how deep into technology people want to go. And so, you know, you can do everything from we have, I think maybe half the fellows this year have sort of text-based things where actually we're going to have Word documents that turn into PDFs, you know, and then we have folks who, you know, like Bob, you're using Lumen. Uh, Janine, we have that app, which it's kind of interesting because we're kind of like de-apping it, right? Like it was an app and now we want to turn it back into PDF. So it's interesting to see how we can kind of leverage all these different platforms and how there's really not a, a kind of one size fits all. Um, Bob, I'm wondering, is, is there anything that's really surprised you so far in your work with OER or something you really weren't expecting about it in terms of positives or challenges? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of material out there. So organizing it, for the students, um, I basically just find stuff and threw it in the OER and I'm using the fellowship to be more organized. So the students have had a little bit of a problem. You know, I say, start with the OER, go to there to start your research. And they say, well, we're just hunting around for stuff. So it's, it's I try to make it a little bit more organized there. Um, it's not, I don't, it, it's, it's time consuming. I'm sure everybody else that's been working on this type of stuff knows that. I mean, it's good that there's a lot of resources out there a lot of redundancy and stuff so finding good reports or dealing with code and computational tools to find how to use them it's, it's hard to find those resources so i am i am trying to make my own material as well uh, i found out there's a lot of there's a lot of good um videos lectures but again it's just you have to take the time to hunt them down and find a good quality ones and i think eventually i'll probably make my own for the computational tool that we're using mm -hmm. um, i that's that's really been it. It's just a matter of, of being focused and, and organized and trying to remember that the students don't know as much as I do. So I want to make it more easy for them to jump onto the OER. And, and you know, we're doing homework on this topic. Here's a section of the OER where, where the topic is. And you can have lecture notes and there's some journal papers and there's some video lectures. So I'm trying to organize it in that way. That's, that's really the main challenge is, is organizational. Yeah, Bob, I'm kind of curious what do you remember, because I know it was a while ago, what kind of initially inspired you to go to that open workshop? I mean, why did you think like, oh, this is something that might be important? Because something that strikes me when, when we talk about this is, you know, you, you, you've kind of just accepted the sort of this like ongoing relationship with the OER, like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing this and I'm gonna be, you know, kind of developing and updating it. And, you know, that, that's kind of remarkable. So I'm just kind of curious, like, how did you sort of get inspired to care about OER in the first place or show up in that workshop? Well, it was held at the Riverside in Boise, so I couldn't turn that down. <laughs> I just got a great hotel, I really, and you can bring your pets. Um, I had just gotten hired, but um, I'd say the, the cohort of faculty at, at my level is looking for better technological solutions in the classroom than just getting a textbook. And they keep coming out with different editions of the textbook and it becomes more and more expensive anyway. So with nuclear engineering has actually been quite a dynamic discipline. Um, I'd say over the last decade, there's maybe like 40 something startup companies working on nuclear reactors and stuff like that. So that stuff's not in textbooks and that stuff is changing every year. And it's not fair to say, get this book, get that book, get this book. I do have them get one textbook for reference um, but I've seen all the different editions since I had the book when I was an undergrad and it doesn't change much and it's just more and more money. So I tell them, find any edition, 
they found it for as cheap as five bucks. I said, don't spend more than 20 or something like that. And then we'll use the OER for everything else. So looking for better technological solutions in the classroom was what I wanted to do. It was a good opportunity. I just gotten hired, get involved with a little bit better with the education. So uh, that's kind of where it's coming from. Uh, when I was a grad student, everything was on the board, handwritten notes all the time and everything, which is fine, but it's just, things are too fast now. And that's just, it's, you need more and more resources as we go. Um, I've built the resources on this OER every year since I've taught the class since 2015. It's just more and more stuff that you want to incorporate into it. So, yeah. and it gives you, um, it gives you the flexibility to do out a derivation or you know find the video lecture, watch this and look for this and stuff like that. So it's almost like you kind of got more time outside the classroom as lecture time, so to speak. So I think it's a bit more of an efficient way to convey the material. Uh, yeah, that, that's, I like, I love what you said right there. That's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, Sarah, how about you? I know that you did your OER project really early in our sort of fellowship year. And so I think you maybe actually tried out your OER on students already. And so I, I would be curious to, you know, same question, what surprised you? What have you learned? And even if you want to speak to what inspired you to try it out in the first place, it would all be great. Yeah, um, I, I used part of it. Um, I'm still actually trying to wrap up some of the end pieces, but they got, the students are pretty, uh, pretty flexible and that they got the unedited versions of things and they were happy to kind of use those early on. Um, I think what works really well in the OER and one of the things that for me I kind of learned and was surprised about was um, first off there's not a lot in the field in which I teach that's available OER but there's a lot in, in supporting areas that I've been able to kind of find and contribute um, and realizing that we actually have a lot of what I teach in a, a bunch of my different courses are actually utilizing extension pubs that is the same concept, um, but they're, they're housed on different types of servers. So I, I think that for me, it was trying to figure out how to navigate all those different components to bring those together um, because none of them are intuitive sites, right? Like none of them have easy search panels or are easy to find kind of what you're looking for. Um, but overall, I think that I was, probably what surprised me the most was how open the students were um, to actually reading the things that I produced as, per, as opposed to reading the previous readings that I had given them. So this is the third iteration in which I taught this class. Um, and I will definitely say that I do not think any of the students read the first two years or they did not read in depth enough. Um, but I could tell when they came into class this year that they had read um, these shorter components that I had given them in which I had written. Um, and I so think cool. because <laughs> they could open them up and they knew it was directed towards what we were teaching in class where the other components were things that had to do with what we were teaching in class. But after about the first week, they realized that it wasn't gonna be almost exactly what we were talking about and that there was gonna be a benefit, but not as high of a benefit as there was um, to being able to interact with that reading directly as to what I was doing. So I think overall it actually helped them and it also helped them, I think when they went to go write their final papers, really see, uh, this is a 200 level class, like how you bring research together to put it together into a cohesive way, right? Because they were reading what I had done and then utilizing that to then go look at other resources to put their papers together. Um, and essentially my resource list or reference list served as a starting point for them to write their papers, which I, I think was good practice for them to understand that that's a normal place to head when it's research is to find something that, that makes a lot of sense for you and then to dive into the, the reference section to actually find um, those specific pieces. So um, I think overall that was kind of the big piece. I mean, inspired it really was, I, I, I had pieced together a lot of the classes that I teach with just different readings or textbooks that were already available um, for free through the library because I could not decide on a textbook that made sense for the majority of my classes. Uh, and I didn't want students to spend money on something that was going to be, you know, $100, $200 and we were only gonna read three or four chapters out of it because those are the only chapters that I really liked when it came to kind of directing the courses. So um, it really was just kind of, I had a friend that said, hey, you're kind of already doing this. You should just, you know, do this in a very intentional way. And, and that was kind of, you know, Marco, when we started those first conversations and we're kind of like, okay, well, um, what is the next step in kind of what's already put together? And, and it really did come down to this whole, okay, let's, I'm gonna create some readings that actually make sense that are smaller and more directed uh, for students to dive into. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's so cool to see the trajectory of this of us talking about it. And, you know, you're sort of saying like, you know, I think I just need to write this, you know, and then doing it. And then, you know, having this really great outcome where you see that, you know, the students are getting the content, but they're also showing these, like those research skills are developing, right. Where you're like, no, this is a good way to do research. You're like showing them how to do that. And so that is really, that's really transformative. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And, and I wasn't even thinking about that when I did it. Like yeah. I wasn't even thinking like, oh, the students would be able to take this and see these are the references that they will use in their papers. Yeah. Um, but it, it turned into that, right? Like yeah. they, and I could tell that they went back and read the papers because they're, or at least for some of them did, because there was stuff written that I did not read right in those smaller documents. That's, that's great. That, that's awesome. That's so cool. Um, so we only have about five, four minutes left. So I want us just briefly make sure we all have a chance to answer this last question, which is, you know, are there any special affordances or advantages that OER provides for your discipline or your specific learning and teaching goals in your discipline? Um, you know, maybe sort of a summary statement kind of addressing that and anything else you want to share out as we, we wrap up the panel. And, and thank you all for your, your great remarks. I'm going to actually just let us close out with saying anything else from me just so that we have full time for remarks. But thank you again. And I'll see if there's any questions that have been submitted. Folks should feel free to send those in right now if we want to try to sneak those in. Um, so Sarah, why don't you um, kind of, you know, if you want to respond to that, any special advantages you feel it imparted and any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that one of the things that that I learned is that I wish that maybe we could get some more people within my field involved in writing some of these pieces because I definitely can't write all of them. Um, but I do Amen. think that one of the things that was really, you know, exceptionally the advantage or the affordance was that uh, the students were completing the reading because it was tailored towards them as opposed to the things that were mismatched or paired together to kind of be those sources that were already available, but we're only somewhat connected to the topic that we are discussing. Thank you so much. Uh, Janine, what about you? Any final remarks or response to that OER affordances for your teaching and pedagogy goals? I mean, I, I think it really comes down to issues of social justice and equity and access. And so all of the students have the opportunity to access the quality materials, whether it's a University of Idaho student who can't afford the textbook, um, or if it's a, a teacher in a refugee camp in Syria who doesn't have access to any kind of teaching materials. So I'm grateful for, for that piece of it. Thanks so much, Janine. And how about you, Bob? Um, I think you kind of touched upon this a little bit in some of the technology affordances, but you know, just any special affordances, advantages OER provides for your discipline and learning and teaching goals and any thoughts to send this out with? Yeah, uh, I agree with our other two panelists that uh, getting more faculty involved is important. And there are some other faculty in nuclear engineering that are kind of working on similar stuff. So that's good. And, and this, my OER, our OER needs to be, uh, you know, show ready before I can really bring it to them and say, okay, let's work on it and this stuff. But I, I there's a few people that are being amenable to that. Um, second, so I guess to close out, uh, you know, my class is a grad class, is we're a graduate program. I'm trying to teach the research process. The OER at least gives that starting point where they can go first, where they don't know what to do for research. And then they can see these papers and see the fundamental material and, and do that. And I do have to say, uh, I usually put a question about the OER in, in the student evaluations and so far so good, basically. Awesome. Well, this is great to hear. Um, it's wonderful connecting with you all. Our Think Open Fellows, I think, are just always an exceptional crop of motivated, excellent professors who are really pursuing just excellence in both their like research, teaching, all elements of their field. And this group has been no exception. So Bob, Sarah, and Janine, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for coming to the panel. Um, I'm sure all of our panelists would be happy to hear from folks um, in their discipline or from across the state who might have questions. You're also welcome to get in touch with me. I'm Marco Cyfley Valencia. Um, and I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but um, thank you so much for your uh, attendance and attention. And I think we're okay to probably switch over to our break, however that works. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you panelists for coming. I really appreciate each of you um, for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Thanks everybody.